We have a uh, asked been singing this song this morning. It's amazing how God works. The songs are talking about when we get to heaven, and that's what this song's about. So. sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to the born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he perfect came flesh and light shine among us his glory revealed living he loved
It's not what I prayed for. It's not what I wanted. It's something that I understand. My circumstances seem so confusing. I'm placing it all in your hands. Your ways are higher than mine. I want mountains to move. You want me to climb. So I'm going to trust your Good job, Mama. Amen. Your ways are higher than mine. Isaiah 55 and verse 9. As high as the heavens are the earth, are my ways higher than your ways. And isn't it a great to be a Christian today? Isn't it, a great, isn't it great to be a Christian every day, any day of the week? But especially today, what a great service. I'm telling you, I feel like I'm at church. I don't know about you. I feel like I'm at church, and that's what I want to feel. Somebody said, well, you can't, you're not saved by feelings. That's exactly right, because sometimes I don't feel saved, but I know I am because I believe God. You know, and some of you today, no doubt, are hurting. Uh, it's been a trying week for a lot of people. It really has. Uh, people uh, from our congregation, those in my home, and so it's, you know, some days are... Days that you struggle through for whatever reason. But thank God he remains the same. God's the same. My salvation is the same. Whether I'm down or whether I'm up, Paul said, I've learned to be content. Learn to be content. Whether I'm abased or whether I'm bound, I believe were the words that he used in the King James. I've learned to be content. And so that's what a Christian can be. That's what he, a, where a Christian can always be. You can always be happy in the Lord on the saddest day of your life, can't you? Because you know your Redeemer liveth. 
and that one day he will come, as the songwriters have said today, and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we will be also. And so I'm thankful today. I'm thankful for his wonderful mercy and grace in my life. And I mean it from my heart, what I said earlier. I'm thankful uh, to be a pa the pastor, or I'm really what keeps y'all from getting a good pastor at Duval's Chapel, you know. I stand in the way of y'all getting a good pastor, but I'm happy to be here. I'm happy. I'm happy as a Christian. I'm happy as a, a part of this church at Duval's. Let's give praise to the Word of God before we preach. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit gave y'all every opportunity not have to listen to me today. I mean, I stood there seeing it. I saw it. Uh, maybe some of you did, but you had every opportunity to just obey the Holy Spirit, to run the aisle, to shout the praises of God, to come to the altar, whatever it is we do when the Holy Spirit orders it up. And you sat right there and waited for me to get up here and bore you with a great message from the Word of God. It'll be great not because of me. It'll be great because it's the Word of God. This is my Bible. The Word of God, inspired, infallible, inerrant, alive, powerful, preserved, sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's Word will never pass away. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will hide its word in my heart that I may not sin against God. A great big hand clap of praise for the word of God. Amen. Uh, forgive me if, there's, if I need to be forgiven, but I may be all over the Bible today with what's on my heart and the Holy Spirit's going to have to put it all together. I'm just going to try to be God's man. Okay, I was, you know, and I really thought, I really thought I, I tried to change the message. I tried to change my mind. I really did on the way down this morning. Brother Woody always calls me, what are you preaching today, you know? And, and uh, um, I wanted to, and really I wanted to go along with kind of where the songs went today about heaven, about, you know, we all face, we're all facing it. It's appointed unto man wants to die, and we're all going to be there one day. One writer said, I will go as all men of the earth, you know, and that's just how it is in this world. And Satan's eating. Thank God for grace. Thank God for the blood that washes our sin away. Thank God for eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, but I'm going to stick with what I really believe God wants me to preach today. And that is, I'll begin in chapter 19 of 2 Kings. Chapter 19 of 2 Kings. I'll read three verses. Three verses. Second Kings is right after First Kings. <laughs> uh, and if you find First Chronicles, then you'll run right into it. Turn left in First Chronicles. Chapter 19. And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes, as was the custom in that day, and covered himself with sackcloth, and, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Elikim, which was over the household, and, and Sheba, Shebna, the, the scribe, and the elders of the priest. covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This is a day of trouble and of rebu a rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. I want to read that again. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to birth and there is not strength to bring forth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the house of God at Duval's Chapel, we bless your holy name. 
We thank you, God, that you are the only true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator of all things. We bless you today in this place of worship. We bless you for this congregation. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, for your son, Jesus Christ, that died for us. We pray if there's any in this audience today that is unsaved, that this would be the time that they would come and make their call in an election sure. Help us, O oh God, to preach this message, not for fame nor fortune, but to bring you glory and honor and salvation to lost souls. I pray this in Jesus' name, and God's people said, Praise the Lord. I want to preach a message that I've entitled, and I got this title from just what I have been hearing in the past few weeks from almost everyone I talked to about the, the times and the signs of the times of this day. Even this morning, there was a preacher that called me, and he said, now, I know I have not been in the ministry as long as you have. To be honest with you, not very many these days have been in the ministry as long as I have. But he said, I have never seen anything like it this time that we're living in. I want to preach a message that I've entitled, I have never seen anything like this time that we're living in. May God help me to preach it. I want to back up here to the scripture that I read to you. All of you that study the Word of God and study the Old Testament know exactly where I'm reading from here in 2 Kings. You know the historical facts of that day and the biblical facts of that day. And the biblical facts are actually historical facts now. Because the historians, the archaeologists and all of these scientists dig over there in this part of the world and they find that these kingdoms did exist and these kings were there in that day and all they had to do is read Kings and Chronicles and they would have known it without spending all the money, right? Spending all the money. And so here we are. Rehoboam had split the monarchy. They, he had split the monarchy. You need to really understand about the monarchy of Israel being split. Israel and Judah. Israel the northern kingdom. Judah the southern kingdom. Jesus would speak later on, seven, eight hundred years later, that a house divided cannot stand. I want you to engrave that in your mind for this message today. A house divided cannot stand. It will not stand. Satan will wants to divide. He cometh not but for to kill, steal, and to destroy, Jesus said. And so one way that he does that, what he loves to do is to divide, divide the people of God in the people of this nation. So, so here we are. The king is Hezekiah. He's a good king for the most part. Did he make mistakes? Absolutely. There's only one that didn't fall short, and his name is Jesus. Now, he was a king, but they crucified him. Now, this was Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. He is listed among the good, few good kings of Judah. The monarchy has been split by Rehoboam 722 years before Christ. It is now 600 years before Christ, or... I'm sorry, it is 700 years. We're still in that day of, of uh, the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire came in 722 and took the, took the uh, northern kingdom, the ten tribes that broke off from the house of David and went to the north. That was 722 B.C. You can read it there. You can read how that they came and, and now they have come up against the walled city of Judah, the city of God. This is where the temple of God is. This is where the people of God are sheltered in there because the Assyrians was raping and pillaging and destroying the known world of that day. They were, uh, they were an ungodly people. Now on a modern day map, you would look at the, the, city, the country of Iran and Iraq. They was that part of the world geographically and they had come and they knew they could take this city. They were more than able to destroy this people and when Hezekiah would peep over the wall, as far as the eye could see, there was, there was Sennacherib's forces, legions and legions and thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands of soldiers was around the city and, and Hezekiah knew, Hezekiah knew knew that they within their own power could not overcome this mighty force. And so he sent the, uh, the, the, uh, his entourage, he sent the, his ambassadors, he sent his committee, if you will, up into this man of God that, was, that we know as Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet. Why would they go to Isaiah? Because they believed in the man of God, right? 
They believed in the man of God. God help us as God's people to get back to believing in each other. You know why our churches struggle this day? We don't believe in each other. And sometimes, sometimes it's probably the right thing not to believe in one another because we do not, we don't live as we ought to to gain the respect of our brothers and sisters in the Lord and the community, in the community. But they believed in this prophet. He had proven himself. He was a man of God. Everything that he would say would come to pass just like he would say it. And so Hezekiah, and when he went up into the house of the Lord, he sent these men to uh, these designated, these chosen men of, of Judah up unto the prophet Isaiah with a word from the king. He said, this is a day of trouble. If you don't believe me, just look over the wall. Just look over the wall. This is a day of trouble. It has come. And here's our dilemma. The children have come forth to be born and mama don't have enough strength to push the babies out. The mama don't have enough strength to push, if you will. And I'm not being ugly. This is exactly what he said. You know what's going to happen? Not only is the baby going to die, mama's going to die. There was no medical science. There was no, there was no C-sections in this day. There was nothing that could bring this baby forth. Hezekiah knew it, and they were all going to come under the, succumb to the power of the Assyrian host because all nations before Judah had succumbed to them. Read your Bible. Everybody has failed in trying to withstand the onslaught of this great Syrian, uh, Syrian force. And so he said, we need help. It's a day of trouble. It's a day of rebuke. It's a day of blasphemy. The, the Assyrians had already wrote a letter and said, we're coming after you and your God will not be able to stand against us. And I'll tell you one thing Hezekiah did right. He called on the Lord and he sent for the man of God, right? He sent for the man of God. And it's okay to send for the man of God in the day of trouble. It's okay. I remember a few years ago when we were fighting against the, uh, the microphones. Fighting against the wet, dry issue. In Butler County, I went into that thing saying, I don't want to make any enemies and I don't want to lose any friends, but I'm going to stand for what I believe. And you say, well, Brother Gary, you shouldn't get involved in politics. Drinking, drunkenness, alcohol was a biblical issue long before it became a political issue. And I'm going to read you some scripture about it here in a minute if God will give me the time, okay? If Duval's Chapel will give me the time. And I remember how that it, was, uh, it got pretty ugly at times. It got pretty ugly at times. And we was fighting against alcohol coming to our little rural county. And I done forgot my point. This microphone done throw me off. But I can tell you this. We was fighting against sin. Fighting against sin. And this is what Hezekiah knew that he was up against. He was up against the devil and these ungodly people that had come to take away the southern kingdom, Judah. The southern kingdom would not fall under Hezekiah because Hezekiah called on the Lord. God sent an angel that night and destroyed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers while they were asleep in their sleeping bags and their hammocks. And when they went back to the city, capital city, Nineveh, the, the commander-in-chief was killed by his own son, there at the capital, God got a hold of it. God got involved in the matter. And this is what we need in our churches and our society today is for God to get back in the matter. For God to get back in the matter. Look, we, we live in a time of trouble. It's a time of trouble. I've never seen anything like it as the title of the message goes. I've never seen. Somebody said, well, there's always been tough times, not like we're witnessing here in the United States of America. And before you get all upset at Brother Gary, I'm not talking about a Democrat and a Republican issue. I'm talking about a sin, an immoral, an ungodly society that has succumbed and give place to the devil, even in our homes and our churches. 
and I'll preach it if you throw your songbooks at me. It's the truth. It's a time of trouble in this nation. Look at what we have been experienced almost since I've been pastor here at Duval's Chapel Church. COVID-19, COVID-19. Somebody said, well, Brother Gary, they just scared us all to death to begin with. We ought to have been scared to death. Because upward of 900,000 have died in the United States of America because of this virus. Now, if you still think that it, it is not a worthy, a formidable foe that we're up against, you've got another thing coming. You've got another thing coming. Carolyn has lost three first cousins in just over a month. We will bury a man on Tuesday that one, is one of the Best guys you ever been around in your life. He would always, you always felt better after leaving him, that kind of person, after talking to him. He was always happy, always upbeat, always. But he went to be with the Lord. COVID-19. I got news this morning about a, of a friend of mine, a pastor friend. His wife the love of his life died this morning with the COVID virus. And the list just keeps going on and on and on and on. And you say, well, Brother Gary, what's the problem? Let me tell you what the problem is. We, we think it's a medical problem, and it is. We say it's a virus, and it is. But I'm telling you, the hand of God is being withdrawn from this United States of America and this planet he is withdrawing the restraints that he has had upon the devil and the world so that now everybody and everything seems to be open to the onslaught of the devil. We ought to get back as it was in the days as Hezekiah called upon the Lord, went to the house of God, and instead of trusting some hotshot politician, we ought to trust the man of God, the spiritual leaders in our home and in our churches and fall on our face and believe. God once again. What are we going to do, preacher? I'll tell you what God, the same God that wrote the book of Isaiah when he wrote the book of 2 Chronicles said in 2 Chronicles chapter 14 verse 7 chapter 7 verse 14 you can look it up. If my people who are called by my name if my people who are called, he didn't say Democrat or Republican. He didn't say Baptist or Methodist. My people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and, see, and turn, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land. We need a healing in the land today. I believe the only hope for the United States of America with this COVID virus is to get back to trusting God. I believe that. I believe that. And I say God raise us up. Raise us up some men, whether they be politicians, men of God, men of God who are politicians or men of God who stand in the pulpit that we can get back to believing again. I, I read up on this. You know, it seems like if you look at American history, that in times of trouble we got closer together than we did further apart. Uh, you can start with the wars. Let's just start with the world wars. We banded together with our allies to defeat fascism with Nazi, with Germany in World War I, with Europe in World War I. Then came World War II. We did the same. Everybody pulled together. It didn't matter who the president was. We knew we had to defeat this foe that was up against us who wanted to rule the world. And along with our allies, we did it. We did it. 
In Korea, it was the same. Vietnam, we started separating because the war come home to our living rooms at night and we started seeing what went on in war. It's always went on in war. War is ugly. War kills people. Innocent die in war. That's how it is. Jesus, that's why he is the Prince of Peace because one day we'll go to a land where he is king and there'll be no more war according to Isaiah. There will be no more war. Then I read President Roosevelt, 19 and 30, 39. There was this disease that plagued our nation and the nations of the world called polio. Polio. Now, most of you are too old to know about polio. I got a polio vaccine when I was a kid in school, grade school. Some of you did, didn't you? And you was glad to get it. Why? Because you knew people that had polio. It was a devastating disease, debilitating disease. It attacked, it attacked your bones, your muscles, and, and you became crippled and paralyzed. And little kids everywhere had polio. And so Roosevelt founded the March of Dimes in 1939, the March of Dimes. And what happened was people sent their dimes in sent dimes in. They had little cards in the grocery stores you could stick a dime in. Kids in public school were sending their dimes in to defeat this disease. Dime after dime, upward of $2 billion worth of dimes came in for the cause because we banded together. But now we have forgotten that a house divided will not stand. And no matter what one person says, somebody's against it. No matter what the other side says, somebody's against it. Well, I just, you know why? We do not believe in one another anymore. That's why. And there's good cause in many areas. We don't care. People don't care. My, our politicians don't seem to care. Some want to defeat the COVID virus because of the midterm elections. Ain't that right? It's about to vote. It's not about my people dying or your people dying or stamping this thing out as they did polio in 1955. Finally, somebody come up with a vaccine to stop polio. Because we work together. Now we're in trouble on the scale that I have never seen before. You know why? Not because God is not still God. Not because God is not still loving and kind and merciful, and, but because God is a holy and just God. And we have hid as though it were our faces from him. We don't reverence him anymore. We don't care about him anymore. We just care about the vote or the almighty dollar. We care more about the price of a Bitcoin or if Amazon's stocks are going to reach 4000 more than we do about people dying and going to hell under the COVID virus or on any, under any virus. It's a time of trouble. It's a time of trouble. Churches ought not have that mindset. We are to be spiritual minded. We are to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the desires of the flesh. We have forgotten the God of glory who gave his son to die for our sin. God help us. We talk more about Kentucky basketball, football, than we do about soul-saving meetings and Amen. hallelujah preaching and singing that will knock your stocks off, gospel singing. We care more about baseball, football, golf, deer stands and bass boats and whatever else, entertainment. We spend more time getting our family and getting the money together to go to Disney World than we do to get our family together to go to heaven. Amen. But we call ourselves the church. Hmm. Study the book of Acts and see what the church really was. Called out ones, given over to the will of God. Given over to the will of God. I heard a little bit of the Sunday school class today. You know why Jesus went to the cross? 
because he was willing to go to the cross. He purposed to go to the cross. That was the purpose that he came into this world. You want to get things done for this church or any church or for the kingdom of God? Purpose in your heart to get it done. To get it done. I'm telling you, I'm sick of the COVID virus for a lot of reasons. Not just because it's taken my loved ones out of this world and people that I know and care about. But it has stammied the progress of this church and other churches since it's we ought to be doing things together, Duval's Chapel. I wanted to have a fall festival. I'm not going to push it because I know people are still scared. But we go everywhere else and do everything else. I see you at Walmart. Amen. I see you at Subway. We do everything else. Yeah, well, I'm afraid that we get together, we may, we may get sick. I'm afraid if you go to Walmart, you may get sick. Amen. So my sentence is, if you're going to go to Walmart, let's go to Duval's. You know what? You know, you're going to be here. I've tried to run you off with my preaching, and you won't run. I worry about my kids, your kids. I worry about them. We need to be doing things with them and for them. Let me tell you something else, and I'll say it again. I'm going to hammer it till we get it. Events will build congregations. You could have a fall festival out here, spend about $30,000 to put it on. I'm kidding a little bit. I tell you, church events are a bargain at any price. At any price, Right? Now, I know they say that about bacon, but it's true about church events. They say bacon's a bargain at any price. I, I agree with that. But it's more true that church events are a bargain at any price as long as they're seasoned with the Spirit of God and with the love of God and with the Word of God, right? Well, I just don't believe we ought to pay all that money for them old singing groups. Well, what are you going to spend it on? I guarantee you, member after member after member of this church will die and you, that none of them took it with them. Right? We can't do enough for these kids here. And we're almost doing nothing. Nothing. Now, thank God for you that are applying yourselves to be there for the kids and to help them as a youth group here at the church. We ought to fill this parking lot up with people. And if it's not big enough, we're going to go rent a football field somewhere and do something that we've never done before to see if it works for God. To see if it works for God. See if it works for God. We can't expect anything different when we continue to do everything the same way. And I want, I want, I want you to know, I want you to know the problem in America is not politics. The problem in America is that we have forsaken the living God. Nobody. How many times you heard anybody with a platform in Washington or on the state level really get serious about calling a prayer meeting of the state or of the nation in behalf, on behalf of this coronavirus? Used to, politicians, presidents would call for days of prayer, national prayer. When we were going to war, we was facing a difficult time just like Hezekiah did. It worked with Hezekiah. It's worked in America before. It'll work again if we'll just believe God. It'll work again. Let me tell you something else. I'm going to preach it. I know you ain't going to like it, but I'm going to preach it. Did you know that God is a pro-life God? Huh? I done looked it up, guys. I, I just had to verify it again this morning. I done looked it up. Did you know that life is mentioned over 160 times in the New Testament? And almost every time is pertaining to the life that, that is in God or Christ Jesus. Did you know that? What are you talking about? I'm talking about in him was life and the life was the light of man. Right? The life was the light of man. You know why we're blinded today? You know why we can't see clearly? You know why our politicians make boneheaded mistake after boneheaded mistake after, and churches are withering on the vine and drying up? It's because we are blind because God is no longer the light of our life. In him was life and the life 
was the light of man, John chapter 1. We're blinded. And if the blind lead the blind, they all fall in the ditch. Is that not right? This is where we're at, guys. We need to get back to God being just a song or God just being in the last message that we heard or God just being there at Christmas or God just... He ought to be the centerpiece of our lives. And this, we ought to fall. You fell in love with me and Carolyn and demonstrated that ever since we've been here. Let's love God more than we've ever loved any pastor, anything else that we've ever experienced. I fell in, we fell in love with you too. God is a pro life God. He that believeth on me should not perish but have everlasting life. Just start reading about life in God, right? Just start reading. Go home. Get your Strong's Concordance or Google it and see how many times there, the Bible teaches that there is life in God and that God is life and that we're dead without Him. We're dead without Him. But yet, but yet, in this United States of America, one na- is it still in the, uh, the Pledge to Allegiance, One Nation Under God? You just don't hear it much anymore, do you? One Nation Under God. And I love the Star Spangled Banner. I love the Christian flag, but to me, the Christian flag don't compare to the Star Spangled Banner because Christianity is more than a flag. This right here is what stands for Christianity. And I'm not knocking you, Christian flag. I probably said the pledge more than anybody else around in the last 25 years at Belmont Christian Academy, if you know what I mean. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I love that star-spangled banner. I love that flag. Because it's supposed to stand for everything this nation should be. And when I see it, I still cry when I hear the national anthem. Because I still think of those that i know that have gone on and gave their lives. But we live in a nation. We live in a nation now that has lost the respect for life and the sanctity of life. We have, we have drive-by shootings, murders, killings. Just read the statistics in some of our cities and you almost don't even hear about it anymore. Think of it. What is it? 39 police officers this year have been killed in the line of duty. In the line of duty. But you hear about a police officer that supposedly mistreated somebody. It'll be on every network in the news channel. What's the problem, Gary? Look, we got to get back to God. Knowing God, loving the Lord will be a pleasant cure for a lot of things that's wrong in our society. In our country, look at this. 62 million babies have been aborted since Roe v. Wade. Here's what David said about life and when it begins. In Psalms 39 and 13, he said, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. You know what the Hebrew says? The Hebrew says, You have created my inner parts. When, he, when David said, you have possessed my reins, the Hebrew writer in, in Hebrew says, you have created my inner parts and you have put skin over my body in my mama's womb. Who did that? God did it. God did it. You are specially and individually made by God. And those guys that got the Nobel Peace Prize for finding, discovering the genetic code Maybe they didn't realize it, but they discovered that God has made everybody individually, purposely, uniquely. Look what he says. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made, verse 14. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully, the Hebrew, great reference. You made me with great reference to who I am and who you were making. Heartfelt interest and respect. That's how God made me. Little old me and you. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderfully unique and set apart. Unique and set apart. Every creature. The drug addict, the pimp, 
the prostitute, the lowest level of life, if you could define lowest level of life, everybody began at conception on the same playing field. The same, the same field, the field was level with everyone. God uniquely and wonderfully made them individually, all of us. And then he gave his son to die for our sin. You want to talk about self-esteem, take a look at Calvary. God did it. But here we are in a world that does not respect life anymore. Anymore. The abortion clinics are flourishing. Let me tell you this, guys. I know what the Bible says. I believe the Bible over any medical scientist. It may be the law. We call it, we murder our unborn, call it abortion, and say it's a woman's right. Rights are given by God, not the government. It's the government's place to protect our rights. And when those rights break the laws of God, then those rights are wrong. They may have the right, but it's not right. You may have the right to do something in this life, but if it's wrong in the eyes of God, you better stay away from it, right? And every politician that backs this, every voter, every doctor, every nurse, without repentance, will stand before God, the white throne, one day with the blood of these unborn dripping off of their fingers. And they'll say, why? God will say, why? And they'll have their flimsy excuses. But it won't work in that day. God is life. He sanctions life. He's the giver of life. And he gave you life and me life. And he, one of the most wonderful miracles that God ever developed or put together is the birth of a child and using a mama's womb to bring forth that child. You mamas that brought forth children... And we'll bring forth children. You're an instrument in God's hands. If I'm telling you right out of the word of God, and I am. You are an instrument in God's hands. But now we have got so smart that we don't need God anymore. Our God is a smartphone, a smart iPad, a smart television. And I'm telling you, there's nothing more dangerous in the hands of a dumb society. That's me. I got a smartphone and it's in the hands of a dumb preacher. About all I know how to do is call somebody and then sometimes I call people I don't even want to call. You know, and some of it, sometimes it's been you, Sammy. <laughs> let me rephrase that. I didn't, <laughs> hey, let me rephrase that. I didn't mean to call. I didn't mean to call. I do that a lot. I do that a lot. Sammy loves me. I'm glad he does because he'd probably whip me, you know. Let's go on. Let's go on. Let's talk about matrimony. Matrimony. Hebrews 13 and 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. What's matrimony anymore? What is it? You know what the law says? The law says that two men or two women can come together and do whatever they do, call it a marriage vows, and some churches say it's holy matrimony. That's wrong. That's wrong. It's wrong. It was wrong in Adam's day. It was wrong in Abraham's day. It was wrong in Lot's day, and it's wrong today. It's wrong. How can God bless a nation that has gone so wrong? How can they? How can a nation use puberty altering drugs to help a child determine if they're male or female and God still bless that society? What are we doing? What are we doing? And you think the army of Assyria was a formidable foe. 
Look at what we're up against today, church. And what troubles me is some churches take no position against any of this. I want to read you New Testament. Some of you thought, well, oh, you've been reading now the Old Testament. Let me read you New Testament. And maybe I'm teaching more than I'm preaching today, but I want to get this across. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? How righteous is our nation these days? Be not deceived, neither fornication, fornicators. What's fornication? Every illicit sexual practice. Idolaters, nor adulterers. Now that's when you're married or somebody's married and they're practicing sex outside of the marriage. Nor if effeminate. What's that? That's male prostitutes. Feminine. That's men believing their women are acting like women. And feminine. It didn't just happen under this administration or the last administration or the one before that or 1960s. It's been around for a long time. It's been in the world ever since Adam fell. Satan has placed it there through sin. And feminine nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuals, guys. That's homosexuals. That's lesbians. wonder why he's targeting these groups so much because in a lost society, this is the impurities that first come to the top, sexual impurities. Look at America. Look at America. Nothing's off limits. What are your kids watching on television? What are they looking at on the YouTubes and on the... Whatever they watch, nobody cares anymore. There's no restraints. God is withdrawing the restraints. I'm going to read it. If I, if I got time, I'm going to read some in a minute that will show you that. Adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, greed. I done told you the Bitcoin is more important than lost souls. Your stocks on the Dow or the NASDAQ or the S&P or whatever, more important than lost souls today. Nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And ain't that what it's supposed to be all about? Ain't that what we're supposed to be all about? Huh? Not just liberties that we should or should not have in America. We're supposed to be the light of the world, the church of the living God and and look where we're going with all of this. Uh, uh, real quickly, real quickly. Don't leave me now. I, y'all, pre, y'all sang a long time, didn't you? Look here. Look. Because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Is that not where we're at? It's exactly where we're at. Why? Because we've neglected the the invisible God. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man and birds. And and you know who's doing this? The television evangelists, many of them. They're changing the image of God into something that he is so far from. Really? They even get up there and teach that Jesus was a sinner until he went to hell and then he had to be born again. And he was born again at the resurrection. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you something. Jesus wasn't a part of God. He was God. He was God. I can't wrap my mind around it. But he was God. And he needed no repentance. That's why he was worthy to die for our sin. And they changed the glory Wherefore God gave them over up unto uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. This is in Romans. This is where we're at. Is this not where we're at? Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worship, and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And a verse here says, 
Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate minds to do the things which are not convenient. And he's talking about homosexuality and same-sex marriage and that stuff. This is where we're at. God warned us, didn't he, Kevin? Didn't he warn us that it was coming? Don't be surprised. He said it was coming. We don't have to buy into it here at Duval's Chapel. And we're not going to. We're not going to. Even when they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You know what our public schools have become? Instead of educating their kids, they're indoctrinating their kids. Hopefully not here in Muhlenberg County or Butler County as of now. But how do you know? How do you know? God bless those parents in Loudoun County, Virginia for standing up. For standing up. If the church had stood up against Roe v. Wade, if the church would have stood up in 61 when they took prayer out of school, if the church would have stood up in 62 when they took the Bible out of school. God help us. God help us. Now I know, I know you feel like a David among the lies. I know, everywhere you turn, it's there. And what are you going to do? You get criticized. You, I've been accused of preaching politics. I can assure you that everything I have preached this morning was biblical before it became political. I just read it to you out of Corinthians. I don't want... Look, I'm not going to twist your arm to keep you from being a drunkard. But I'm going to tell you the truth about it. I want you to go to heaven. That's the only reason. I'm no better than you are except for the blood of Jesus. I'm a drunkard. I come out of a long line of drunkards. But God saved me, Charlie. He saved me. And it's never been a part of my life. But it would have been. It would have been. I want you to go to heaven. I want Muhlenberg County say, I don't care what political preference people have. I want you to be saved. Get right with God. Walk right. Talk right. Let's fill these pews up with unsaved people to hear the word and to get saved. We're backslidden people. I've never seen anything like this time. Don't fall out of church. Don't quit on us. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on yourself. Your family deserves better than that. You deserve better than that. As a Christian... Let's get it right. Let's get it right. I'm longing. I'm praying. I dream in my mind. I have visions of a day when we're back to doing what we ought to be doing for God. And COVID is no longer an excuse. Or poli our politics is no longer an excuse. We do what this says. Amen. Live for Jesus. And we respect one another when we disagree on some things. But we got to agree on this, on this and what it says. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. You need prayer today? Come on, pray. <clears throat> Jesus died for your sin, rose again for your justification. There's no other way to heaven. No other way to heaven. He loves Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and equally. But we all got to be saved to go to heaven. I'm so sick of hearing about politics. I'm so sick of it. I want to hear about Jesus. I want to hear about what God can do to our lives and transform our lives into vessels of honor. Vessels of honor. How that He can heal us and heal our marriages and heal our children. And Let's have church. Let's have church.
problems are troubles to Jesus. Y'all come in and pray with hell. Pray with hell. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. 